Good morning, everyone. I'm Ben Ogles, Dean of the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences. We're so glad to welcome you here for this final lecture of the semester. I'm just kidding. I don't know if it really will be. <laughs> it, by the end of the day, we might have that information, and if not, it could. it's obviously an ever-changing, very fluid situation, and we're glad to be able to still have uh, this lecture, though, today. Martin B. Hickman lecture from uh, John Hoffman. We're going to start by having an invocation by Claudia Soto. Thank you, Claudia. It's the 27th annual uh, Martin B. Hickman Outstanding Scholar Lecture. This is the most prestigious college award that we have for a faculty researcher. And we're glad that John is uh, willing to do that. It's named after uh, Martin B. Hickman, who was dean of the college for 17 years. I've, I've been the dean for nine. I can't imagine what it must have been like to, to do it for nearly double that. Um, and we're gonna have his daughter, Allison, uh, do a little, a few remarks about him. There's also some comments about him. You'll see that he had a, a tremendous influence on our college and many things that are on campus uh, st started from his efforts and continue today. So he continues to have an, have an influence. After Allison says a few things about her father, then we'll have uh, Michaela Dufer who will introduce John and then we'll have his presentation. Allison. Just wash my hands. Oh, I'm going to move the microphone down. <clears throat> um, uh, my dad was the uh, dean when the college was combined with the fa uh, family home and social uh, family living college, and Richard Craycroft, who was the dean of the um, humanities, who was a character. Uh, when they roasted my dad as he uh, retired from that position, he said, well, Martin, come on. You were the dean of the College of Family, Home, and Mother's Milk. So, um, but of course, we know that it is much broader and encompasses much more than that. My dad was a polit political scientist and taught international relations and constitutional law here at BYU. And I think that it is fitting that he... Um, he studied political structures, but in this college we have um, disciplines that study social structures and we have disciplines that study the family, which of course are all interrelated and interconnected in how we live together and the relationships that we have. That this week we celebrated the international or the national day of the woman and in our family, um, being the father of six girls and the uh, husband to a wife, uh, that was a day that my dad uh, celebrated every single day of his life. And he was a very fair and loving and um, kind man who left us a wonderful legacy as women and we're grateful to that. And in fact, he was the first dean on campus to have a woman associate dean. And so, um, uh, one other thing that's also fitting today, it's my mother's birthday. And uh, anyone who knows my dad knows that she was the center of his life. And they together formed the first social structure that we were um, uh, shown and showed us how to live. And it has blessed our lives ever since. My dad spent a summer in England in 1970 in the days when um, long distance phone calls were very expensive and so letters went back and forth. And he was uh, a homebody. His best friend, Ray Hillam, had a cabin up at Sundance and always wanted my dad to go up there. And he said, I, I'd rather sleep in my own bed. So poor Ray was uh, not able to coax him up there for a night, although for many days he was. But my dad was also a poet, and he's written poems uh, to my mother. And I would like to share one uh, with you today. My mother was a very out, outgoing, gregarious, humorous, 
larger than life individual. My dad was much more measured, kind of the wind beneath her wings kind of thing. But together they made a really wonderful whole. So excuse me if I get a little bit emotional, but I'll give it my best shot. From London he writes, I'm told that Elizabeth rules in London town. She reigns in majesty or castles, knights, and ladies fair. To her is due all obedience, honor, and fealty. But in one corner of her realm, this queen is not supreme. For my heart owes allegiance to a monarch of another land. She commands no royal guard, no far-flung far armies answer to her call. Okay, just a minute, spam risk. <coughs> No far-flung armies answer to her call, but where she rules, my enemies are put to flight, not by sword or strength of arms, but by her love. She ends their alien sway. Thus, safe within her kin, I scorn those ancient foes, loneliness and fear. And then my knee is bent in homage to my queen, and I accept her sovereignty. So today, as we think of all the things that we learn here in the College of so Family, Home, and Social Sciences, and because we are covenant makers and keepers, and we have made covenants in the temple, we can lay claim to the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant as through the work you do here and in your homes and at church, you can bless the nations of the world. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I will also touch the microphone. Um, our speaker today, John Hoffman, is anything but a cliche but uh, it might be useful to employ a cliche to orient you to his many impressive achievements. He's truly a Renaissance man. Uh, this first becomes obvious in looking at his education. Professor Hoffman received a bachelor's degree in political science from James Madison University, a master's degree in justice studies from the School of Public Affairs at American University with an emphasis on drug policy, another master's degree in public health from Emory University with an emphasis in epidemiology, and a PhD from SUNY Albany in criminology. Before taking a position with the Department of Sociology at BYU, he worked for the National Opinion Research Center, and he's also held positions at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, Emory University School of Public Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where they could probably use him today, and the University of South Carolina. Dr. Hoffman has won a number of honors and awards, including the John A. Widstow University Fellowship, the Carl G. Mazur Research and Creative Arts Award, the Jack Bailey Teaching and Learning Fellowship, and of course the Martin B. Hickman Scholar Award. He's also won more than $5.3 million in grants and served on eight editorial boards, including three currently. Dr. Hoffman has taught thousands of students, uh, perhaps most impressively, uh, persuading the unwilling to understand and embrace statistical methods. And he's been a major architect in his department's approach to statistical training and rigor. Professor Hoffman's life as a Renaissance man can also be seen in his many, many publications. He's published 20 book chapters, 83 articles, two edited books, and seven books. His published work spans topics from religious participation and attitudes, to gambling, to criminological theory, to statistical methods, to, of course, the topic of his talk today, juvenile delinquency, and in particular, drug use or substance use. Perhaps most impressive, is that he's met his goal to write enough books to dedicate one to each member of his family. His wife, Lynn, his sons, Brian, Christopher, Brandon, and Curtis. Lynn, Christopher, and Brandon are able to be here with us today, and perhaps most exciting for me, John's mother, Joy, is also able to be here with us today. She also has a book dedicated to her. Professor Hoffman's broad interests extend beyond academia. He's an expert in nutrition, poetry, movie westerns, science fiction, and how to keep a magnolia tree alive in an inappropriate climate. He's a compassionate teacher, a rigorous and productive scholar, a thoughtful colleague, and a most excellent friend. 
Please join me in welcoming Professor John Hoffman. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, if I seem a little nervous, it's because I forgot to take my Xanax this morning, but <laughs> I thought given that I'm talking about drug use, I probably should <laughs> skip that today. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'd like to thank the Hickman family for being here and sponsoring this, helping to sponsor this. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues who are here, um, thank those who, who um, looked over my talk and saved me from embarrassing myself. And I'd like to thank my family for being here, as Michaela mentioned, a few across the country, uh, just to be here, uh, to be with us today. So uh, I appreciate that. I just want to mention that you'll notice that the, if you look at the program, you'll notice the talk, the title of the talk it changed because it was one of those things where they asked me to do, come up with a title and I just came up with it on the fly. And then I realized it sounds kind of presumptuous to talk about the realities. And I'm, I don't know that I'll give you any realities. And so I reconfigured the title into Myths of Adolescent Drug Use. So let me, let me start off with this, though. Um, uh, I do have to say that don't do drugs. <laughs> uh, I don't want anybody to mistake anything I have to say. Let me see if this thing works. There we go. I don't want anybody to mistake anything I have to say today with to give, to give you license that you should use drugs, okay? So some of you may remember when Michael Jordan first came into the league, he was sponsored by McDonald's and used to give anti-drug commercials, and who can forget Nancy Reagan and her slogan, just say no. So anyway, so don't, please don't go away from this thinking that I have said, yes, you know, drug use is okay in any way. When I was growing up, that's not me, but it looks kind of like what I looked like when I was young. When I was growing up, I, what, my favorite thing to do was to read Greek myths. I used to just devour them. I had all sorts of books of Greek myths, and I just loved the adventure stories I love the, 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 the jealous gods and the, the flawed mortals and, the, and, and the, the intrigue and the swashbuckling and all the things that went with that. Then I grew up and became a social scientist and that ruined it all. Because I realized, I learned anyway, that myths are not just ancient stories, are not just considered ancient stories, but rather they actually provide guidance to us as a culture, as a people. When I think about myths, I'm talking not about stories that, you know, once you find out what, the, what, what life is really like, that they're somehow false. Rather, from a, from a sociological and social science perspective, uh, myths are narratives. They're, sa they're symbolic stories that help us to understand the important things in our culture, in our society their beliefs, their folklore, their, 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 their things that help us to understand what's going on. And so when I talk about myths of, of, of drug use or myths of adolescent drug use, I'm not saying these are all falsehoods about drug use. What I'm saying is that these are the stories we tend to tell ourselves about drug use. And some of those stories, of course, are going to be conflicting stories. So, you know, why about drug use? Because it is full of myths, as we're gonna be talking about in just a minute. The trouble, with, the trouble with some of these myths or these symbolic stories about drug use is sometimes if we don't think about them carefully or use them carefully or understand where they come from, they can lead to bad policy, bad programs about what we should do, for instance, when there are problems associated with with, with drug use, or we meet groups of people who might be in, involved in drug use. So let me start off with the first myth I'm going to talk about, and that is this, that substance users and problem users, I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna be making that distinction a lot because I don't, want, I don't want the understanding to be that any substance use from a broader perspective is, a, is problem use. I'm going to distinguish those two, but Here's an idea that's, that, that's out there quite often, is that substance users and problem users are different from us. They're different kinds of people from us. And so why would that, why would that have any implications? Why would that have any implications for, for what I'm trying to, 
to say here. Well, in the social sciences, especially in studies in social deviance and social psychology, there's a idea called othering. Some of you who've studied sociology, social sciences understand that term. The idea that there are people who are different than us. Unfortunately, oftentimes that difference or that otherness tends to be based on people looking different from us or coming from a different culture. Maybe their skin tone is different. Maybe they speak a different language or they have an accent. And we tend to other people. Now, that's a natural thing. We think about categorizing people and categorizing things. It's a, it's a natural human tendency to do that. The trouble is, is that sometimes when we do that, we tend to also impute certain kinds of behaviors that we see as deviant on others. And so when you look at the history of, 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 drug, of the drug laws in this country, you see a lot of this went on. For instance, initially, mo many of our laws against opium use in the late, that came about in the 1800s were based on the idea that it was Chinese immigrants who were the ones who were using these, using these substances, but they were using them in a kind of a nefarious way, and they were trying to get other people to use them in that way also. If you look at cocaine, you find that much of the, many of the laws that, were, that originally were passed that, that prohibited cocaine were based on stories about African American, uh, violent African American men in the 19 teens and 1920s who were violent, attacking people, and so forth. If you, look at the, if you look at laws against marijuana, many of those were based on perceptions about Mexican immigrants during the 1930s, or, or African-American jazz musicians during the 1940s, or young people during the 30s and 40s. Some of you may remember there was a movie called Reefer Madness, for instance, which is kind of a cult classic now, but at the time was taken very seriously when it was made. And so, we tend to do this, and we tend, and it, it, this continues to this day. We tend to also, we tend to still think about, we think about drug users or people who are who are who are drug addicts or or um, some other sort of uh, appellation that we put on somebody. We think about them in a cer as, as certain kinds of people. And an example of that, there was a study that came out a few years ago that followed a group of, of young, young people into adulthood for about, they followed them for about 13 years. And what they found was that African Americans, African American males, were about twice as likely as, Af as Caucasian males to be arrested for drug possession. Now, it didn't matter how, it didn't matter their actual drug use. So in other words, the researchers actually took that into account the drugs they used, they also took into account things like the neighborhood they lived in, their socioeconomic status and so forth, and still the African American males were twice as likely to be arrested. I just wanted to, I just wanted to put these two pictures up here, and I doctored them a little bit, I have to admit, to make, it, to make the point a little bit more strongly. But you look at these two guys right here. The first guy probably looks like you know, somebody who could be your bishop, right? You know, he's got a flag behind him. It looks like he might have a military uniform on or something like that. Um, the other guy looks like somebody who we might just be a little, you know, some people might be, I'm talking about drugs here. So maybe you looked at that, maybe you probably didn't, but some people might look at that and they say, oh, you know, cartel, you know, or something like that. Well, you can already tell where I'm going with this. I'll give you the second guy first. This is the most successful DEA agent in, in the history of the Drug Enforcement Administration. He was very successful. He actually took down cartels, okay? The first guy was a, was a, is a physician who's now in federal prison for prescribing more than 500,000 op, uh, uh, doses of opioids to people in West Virginia and Ohio. So when we think about the other, they're us, right? They're us, so I wanna keep that in mind. Second, drug dependence or addiction, what's, what's now called substance use disorders or SUD, may be a disease, but it's a voluntary disease. I'm sure some of you have heard that before. So there are people who get addicted to substances who have these disorders, and oftentimes we hear, well, they brought it upon themselves. They, were, you know, they, used, they, they made a choice to use these substances, and they must not have had, you know, they must not have had a strong will or they must not have had mental fortitude. You know, that kid over there started using, started smoking cigarettes and or started smoking marijuana. And so he must not have like a strong will. Some, you know, it must not be, you know, have, have a strength of character 
to do this sort of thing. Now, of course, there's a grain of truth to some of that. Sure, when somebody uses drugs, typically they use them the, for the first time because they choose to do it. There's, there, you know, there, there's the myth of the, I didn't talk about this myth, but there's the myth of the drug pusher on the corner who's giving out free samples so he can hook kids to, to drugs. That's generally a myth. Most people, when they get drugs, they get it from their friends. They get it from their family members. Um, they get it from somebody they know and trust. So there is a grain of truth to that. However, we've learned a lot about, this, about whether this is a voluntary process by doing a lot of research over the years. And I just say they're, they're in, 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 involuntary, but they're also semi, I'll call them semi-voluntary influences. Different social environments are going to encourage or discourage drug use to a different degree. Your family and your friends' behaviors. Many kids start off because a sibling is using substance, is using a drug and, and shares it with, with them. Sure, it's voluntary for you know, the 12-year-old the thir- the to, to, to smoke with his older brother, but his older brother does it, right? Stressful life experiences. We know that people who, who, who have more stress in their lives are more, also more likely to use substances and have problems with these substances. We also know a lot more, and if I, was from, if I was from the neuroscience program, I could talk a lot more about this, but we also know that there, there are genetics and heredity, and heredity that affect whether people use or continue to use. Um, about, well, it's been about, what, 30 or 40 years ago, there was this wonderful book. This is probably the best book that, that I think has ever been written on. On, on substance abuse and substance use. And it was by Norman Zinberg. Zinberg was a um, psychiatrist at Harvard University. And he spent his career studying pe- you know, why people use and why people have problems with, with drug use. And what he found was that there is, no re- there is no addictive personality. There is no character flaw that causes people or that leads people to become addicted. Rather, what he found was it depended on a couple things, and that's the title of his book, Set and Setting. One is set, and that is when people start using, it's, the, it's, the, it's their mindset, it's their expectations, it's their mood about use. But as important, or maybe more important, is their setting, what environment they're in. And certain environments are much more conducive to both, both drug use as well as problem use. Um, anyway, I recommend the book highly. It's still, it still is relevant to this day. Uh, the next one, let's see. Illegal drugs have similar detrimental effects on users. Legal drugs are safer. Now, probably as member, as if, if you're a member of the church, you probably would disagree with that, and I'm going to disagree with that. Not just because I'm a member of the church either, but because it's not necessarily true. Because what we know is or what we're pretty certain of, although it's interesting because you can only do research on certain substances to a certain extent, so we're not quite sure. But it looks like the most harmful substances for the human, or among the most harmful substances, include cigarettes or, the, or, the, or smoking cigarettes and alcohol. Alcohol does all sorts of things at the cellular level, as does as does smoking cigarettes. And and yet we tend to think about. Other, we te- when we focus on problem use, we tend to think about other substances, which I'm going to talk about some more here. But I just want to make a, a, a comparison here between one that's, you know, this, this one drug that is, uh, that's used by about, on a fairly regular basis, by about half of the population or so, and this other one that is sort of the scary demon of the, of the drug world, and that is alcohol and heroin. Um, so if you, look at, if you look at the effects of, of, of alcohol and heroin, I already mentioned alcohol tends to be, tends to be quite damaging at the cellular level. Um, heroin, not so much, at least from what we know, from, because you can't, do, you can't do much research on heroin, so it's a little bit difficult to tell, but we know from studies of morphine and um, other derivatives of the opium poppy that um, it doesn't seem to do, it doesn't seem to do a whole lot of damage, at least at that level. So I have three statements, you could probably already guess um, what, the, what the answers are, but without medical attention, withdrawal is, withdrawal is often lethal. If you're an alcoholic and you're going through, and you're a pretty serious alcoholic, you're going through withdrawal, you better run, to, you better, or if you know somebody, to, you better get them to the emergency room right away because alcohol withdrawal can be deadly. It can kill people, and it has killed a lot of people. Heroin withdrawal, it's, people will die on occasion. I mean, it's agonizing. Um, I, don't know if, I don't know if any of you remember the, the, 
Frank Sinatra movie, Man with the Golden Arm, but they sort of played that up a lot in that movie in the 1950s. But um, anyway, it's very agonizing, but it's rarely lethal. It's, people rarely die from, from it. Um, if we look at people who use heroin, um, you know, we, we, I'll get to this in a little bit, but we tend to think, you know, don't get near that stuff, it's really dangerous. And yet what we find is that about three out of four people who, who, you, who have used at least on a somewhat regular basis, they just stop using on their own. Um, now, I, as I mentioned, one of the, or as I was inferring, one of the problems is we don't have a lot of research on it, so we don't have a good idea about um, how many people who use the substance become, uh, have a problem with it. We know it's about 10% to 15% actually about, of alcohol users end up with a alcohol disorder. For heroin, we're not quite sure, but it's probably maybe around 20% or so, some studies indicate. Um, the, one that, the one that latches on to people the most is nicotine. Nicotine, about a third of the people who try it, I mean literally just try it and smoke a cigarette, end up with a dependence issue. So nicotine is something we ought to watch out for. Um, and, and, and be careful about. I just thought it was interesting how um, here heroin is the highest schedule prohibited substance. Alcohol, you can go down to many grocery, I don't know about Utah laws, but in many states you can go to a grocery store and buy liquor. In fact, in 2017, the Florida Senate passed a, a has legislation said, yeah, go ahead and sell whiskey and whatever you want in, in grocery stores. All right, next one. This is one that comes out of a book that came out in 1972 that's a really, it's actually, it was actually used a little bit tongue in cheek by the researchers, but it was called, don't, it's so good, don't even try it once. And you hear that about various substances. They were talking about heroin, but heroin, cocaine, we've seen a lot of reports about this. Methamphetamine was the most recent one about, they're so good, don't even try them once. If you try them once, they got you. You are going to be, you're gonna be enslaved to this stuff. Now, where does that come from? Well, there's this idea that, that one is they're profoundly intoxicating. They have a very strong physical effect, very pleasurable, and a very high dependence potential. So if you use it, it's gonna change your body chemistry, your brain chemistry, and you're gonna become addicted. There's this term instant addiction that, that, that became popular a number of years ago, and you still hear it to this day. You still, if you go up on, on some drug uh, prevention sites on the internet, you'll still see that term, that term um, instant addiction used. The research indicates it's not so simple, though. The research indicates that, become, that for any of these substances, usually what happens is it takes quite a bit longer in order to, you have to use it for quite a while before you actually end up with a dependence problem. It'll happen, but it'll happen with any of these substances. If you use enough of them and you use it often enough, you're probably gonna become dependent to that, to that substance. But it's probably gonna depend also on your genetic susceptibility also. Um, so as many, many people, the first time they try, you know, whether it's cigarettes, alcohol, cocaine, heroin, whatever, some people just have a really bad reaction to it and they say, I never wanna get I never want to go near that stuff again. Other people have a really strong reaction to it. So um, it, 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 it may just depend on, you know, what's your, what's, pick your poison, you know, which one is it going to be. I think one of the, play, one of the reasons why this became so popular, it seems like one of the reasons, is because there, you may have heard of these rodent studies. There are, some, there are some monkey studies too, where they'll take a rodent and they'll put it, and they'll, they'll, they'll put it in a cage and they'll give it access to as much wa uh, water laced with either cocaine, methamphetamine as they want. And the rat will just drink it, drink it, drink it, and will give up eating the food pellets and, and that sort of thing. So this became sort of, oh wow, look what, those, look what those rats are willing to do in order to get high. And then, and then they imputed that to humans and said, look what humans will do in order to get high. Well, it turned out that it wasn't so simple because one of the things they found is when they took rats and they put them in a, in a nice environment, in other words, they put, you know, they built, what were those habit trail things, or I'm not sure, I can't remember what they were called, but you give them a good environment, they actually don't care about the, they don't even go near the, or very rarely will they go near the, the, the drug. And so you have to wonder, what about humans? Well, this guy here um, is Dr. Carl Hart. He's a professor at Columbia University, a, a neuropsychologist, um, or a neuroscientist, and he wrote a really interesting book called High Price, but he's been doing research for years. And what he did, he took, he, he, he would recruit um, 
you know, the story of the stereotypical addicts from poor areas of New York, and he'd bring them into his lab, and he'd um, sort of do some, he'd do various types of uh, uh, monetary experiments to see what would they do um, to give up, to, to not use this, to not use a drug. The interesting thing is the, a lot of these addicts told him, yeah, you know, the craving is bad, but it's not that bad. You know, give me 20 bucks and I probably won't need to even use it for the next, next few days or so. And his argument was that it really is about the environment. It really is the environment these people are in that really leads to these problems. Okay, if you, if you put people in a very disadvantaged, very poor, very stressful environment, they're probably gonna look for something to dull the pain that, of their lives. So I have a couple quotes here. One is by uh, Gabor Mate, who wrote a really interesting book. Thanks, Corey. Corey um, turned me on to this book, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. But um, Dr. Mate has been a, 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 a physician who's taken care of um, home, primarily homeless uh, substance abusers in Vancouver, British Columbia. And very poetic writing, I'll let you read that just for a couple minutes. And, and then the second one, some of you may have heard of this book called Dope Sick by the journalist Beth Macy, and she studied the opioid crisis in this country. And let me just give you a, a little bit to read that and to just think about how that reinforces the idea that it's largely about the environment that people are in when they're using these substances. Why are they using these substances? Here you have some reasons why this is going on. So I think that we probably need to, I think we need to modify this myth about addiction, especially about instant addiction. The idea that there's instant addiction is probably not very helpful to us if we want to help people who have problems or if we want to prevent people from getting involved with, with drugs. Instant addiction is probably not the, the, the it, it, it sort of becomes a scare tactic that doesn't work very well. And I'll talk a little bit more about prevention in a little while. But rather, we need to think about setting. I, you know, when I talked about set and setting, we need to talk about the setting in which these people use substances, because that seems to be when people have problems. And it's about susceptibility also. There are some people who are highly susceptible to nicotine or alcohol, so maybe those are the drugs they shouldn't even try once. Okay, stay away from those. But unfortunately, we don't often know, like I said, pick your, pick your poison. Okay. So let me get a little bit, dive into adolescence a little bit. There's this notion that adolescent substance users graduate from softer to harder drugs. I'm sure you've all heard this one. It's, it's, it's touted in just about every youth prevention program out there. It's very, it's, very, it's very common in the popular media about drug use and so forth. Well, first, as I, as I, as I hope I did a little bit before, I'd like to dispel the notion that they're hard and soft drugs, okay? Um, what does that mean? Is it fit about the physical damage, dependence damage? What is it? One of the places comes up a lot, you've probably heard this term too, gateway, that there are gateway drugs out there that, well, I'll just give you a current example, vaping. A lot of people are vaping these days, electronic cigarettes or electronic deliver, uh, nicotine delivery systems. And there's this idea that, well, if you start vaping, you know, kids, if you start vaping, your next thing you know, you're going to be smoking cigarettes, you're going to be doing alcohol. Once you start doing alcohol, you're going to be doing cocaine. Once you start doing cocaine, you're going to be doing heroin. Okay. So there's this gate, you know, it opens up the gate to that. However, what we know is that, is that there's some, that that's not the appropriate way to look at it. Where this oftentimes comes from is people will interview heroin addicts or cocaine addicts, and they say, well, what'd you start out using? Like, what was the first drug you used? And they, they should say aspirin, but what they say is, oh, I started smoking when I was 11 or 12, and then I started drinking. And if you look at, if you look at, 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 at survey data that, that, ha that, that asks uh, people who, are use who have used heroin, what'd you start out? About 98% of heroin users 
um, started off or used cigarettes first or, nicot or cigarettes earlier, and about 98% used alcohol. So yeah, 97, 98% used cigarettes or alcohol. Um, and so people, so people then turn that into, well, must be a gateway drug because look at what happened. All these people started out this way, but we need to go the other direction. <laughs> And so I went and um, looked at some, at, some lar at, at, these, at some large national data sets. And what I found, and this is consistent with what other people have found, people who use alcohol, about 17% of them use cocaine at some time in their lives. Okay, some time in their lives. For people who smoke cigarettes, about 3% use heroin sometime in their life. Now that may sound low or high to you, but it's actually pretty close to the average of how many people have used these drugs. So about 14% of, pe of, of, of people in the United States um, past the age of, I think it's 18 or so, about 14% have used cocaine versus 17% of alcohol users have used cocaine. That doesn't seem like a very, if that's a gateway, it's a very narrow gate. Um, about 2.8% of people have used heroin in this country well, that's only 3% if you're a cigarette user. So, you know, maybe it's a funnel. It's not really a gateway, it's a funnel. You have a lot of people who use cigarettes, alcohol, very few move on to, loot, to use these other sorts of substances. In fact, what happens is most adolescents who use, they, we've used the term mature out of it. And so this is a study I've been, I've, I, I worked on um, for many years, and I just wanted to look, we followed, um, uh, a group of, of adolescents and up into young adulthood. And you can see we have um, whether they use marijuana in the past year, how often they use marijuana, and whether they use other illicit drugs, which includes the list I have there, both very similar. So you find that it tends to peak around age 19 or so, probably when they're in college or just starting off in college, but then it drops off after that. So what you have is you have that funnel. You have a large group that may start off using some things, but then they don't use it anymore. They stop using after, after when, they, when they reach young adulthood or emerging adulthood. So what's going on here? Well, it's more likely if we're thinking about, if we're thinking about people who have problems, it's more likely they have a common liability. There's some sort of configuration of social, emotional, psychological, neurological factors that actually leads some people to use multiple substances and to have problems with their use. And it probably includes, as, I, as I've already mentioned, the setting they live in, their mental health issues, and all, the, all those other things. Okay, all right, here we go. This one's not gonna make you happy. Um, parents, especially if you're from the school of family life, I guess. Uh, parents can prevent their children from using drugs by, here are three of them, being strict and telling them about the dangers of drug use. Punishing them harshly if they use drugs. Go, go cut a switch. Um, this one, sorry about this one, having regular family meals to discuss problems such as substance use. Um, the first one, Steve Barr's here, my colleague and, and co-author on many studies, and we've looked at this issue about parenting. And what we find is that being strict is not the answer. Being strict actually, being overly strict actually, you're gonna drive your kids to to, to use drugs, okay? I mean, you know, on average, so to speak, or the research seems to suggest that. Being overly permissive, you're probably gonna do the same thing. You need to find that sort of that middle ground, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more later when I talk about some of our research. Um, physical punishment tends to lead to a higher risk of substance use. Having regular family meals, this came a, f a number of years ago, this group called CASA out of Columbia University put out this big report and they said, here it is, the magic bullet, they didn't call it the magic bullet, but here it is, the magic bullet that will prevent kids from using drugs, gotta have meals together. And just some of you may remember, but I hope you'll forget, somebody said in a general conference talk too, um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have family meals together, what I'm saying is that the research that I've been, in, that I've been involved in indicates that family meals don't have that effect. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit here. All right, the war on drugs is winnable. We can be victorious with drug prevention and mass media programs for youth. Now, some of you may remember, if you're old enough, uh, President Nick, Richard Nixon uh, declared a war on drugs in about 1972. 
And ever since then, we've had this sort of war, we've, many people have had this war mentality. It tends to crop up because we keep going through these drug epidemics. So we have the crack cocaine epidemic of the 80s and 90s. We've got to declare a war on that. We now have the opioid epidemic. We have to declare a war on that. Um, we need to get all our resources to, and, and apply it towards winning this war. You may, that may be a helpful metaphor or not. I'm not going to judge that necessarily. What I want to do, what I want to say is even people who disagree with it were kind of pleased with it because it, it actually gave, it actually uh, sort of infused more, more uh, funding into things like prevention programs. And so you started seeing all these prevention programs. DARE became huge. DARE still exists. It's in about 50 countries as well as all over the country. Sorry, folks, it doesn't work. DARE doesn't work. There's no research that indicates that DARE works. There are, there, people have tried to develop other programs, and there's a, there's a mix of evidence. Some programs will so show some effect. The trouble is most of them don't have much of a long-term effect. So there are resilience programs. There are, there are sort of um, uh, emotional management programs, all sorts of programs. M most of them are, are ineffective, and most of them are poorly targeted because they, they take a sort of a huge, a huge brush, and they try to just figure out how can we prevent drug use from, from anybody from using, and yet the people you need to be worried about are those who, as I mentioned before, those who end up having problems, and targeting that group is, 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 rather, is rather difficult, and these, these programs don't necessarily do it. Okay, this one has two parts because you, you find it on both sides of the aisle. Drug treatment works, or drug treatment doesn't work and is not cost effective. Well, drug treatment does work, but different people might need different programs. So some people might need a 12-step program, which works for, for many people. Some people might need cognitive behavioral therapy, works for many people. Um, if you're addicted to opioids, you might need a drug maintenance program, at least for a while. Maybe you need to be on methadone or some of these other, sub, some of these other new drugs that help people that are longer lasting and don't have the same same, uh, they don't uh, have the same physical reaction, or you don't have the same physical reaction to them. Um, it, it, just, it just depends. Now, unfortunately, because a lot of these treatment programs are, are very specific and they take a big group of people and then they don't work with some of those people because they probably need another program, there's been this notion out there that nothing works. Well, that's not, that's, that's not true either, because there are things that are effective. And I just have this little thing up here. I don't have time to talk much about it. But then I thought this was, oh, sorry, I got kind of messed up there. Um, but this, what I want to show you is these are success rates. So basically, this is in a year, people still using these drugs. And what you find is that for, op for this large hospital where there's, this was done, you found about 60%, about 55% of, of people who have an opioid dependence or cocaine dependence problem were successful in the treatment, okay? But they compared it to how successful are you for these chronic diseases, and what they found was diabetes is about 60% effective too. Well, we don't think about diabetes, people with diabetes as being others. You know, we don't other them. We tend to say, we know, we know that this is a chronic disease and you may have brought it, you know, you may have, you may have in this mindset brought it upon yourself in a sense because you drank a six pack of Coke for the last 20 years, right? Or you've consumed tons of sugar for the last 20 years. But we don't tend to other those people and say, well, therefore, you know, it, that was voluntary. So that you have a voluntary disease. Is it cost effective? Well, yeah, most studies indicate that drug treatment is cost effective. There's a range of estimates for, but generally for about every dollar we spend on drug treatment, we get about seven to twelve dollars in savings because of lower criminal justice costs, you know, fewer arrests of people, lower um, treatment costs, lower subsequent treatment costs, and so forth. Okay, I'm going to try to get a little more positive. The blue bird of happiness has, ri has arisen, so I'm going to try to get a little bit more positive here. However, I do want to say. Well, the idea is that there's little we can do, and so far I've kind of said that, and, I don't, and I'm going to change gears now. But I do want to mention there's no panacea out there. There's no magic bullet, magic elixir that's going to stop every kid from using drugs. Um, in, some, you know, in families in which the parents do the best job they can, they may still have children who have these problems. Okay? There's, like, there's, there's really no secret sauce to this. But there are some things we can do to increase or decrease the likelihood of, of, of kids using substance. What can we do as parents? Well, 
Steve Barr and I, our research indicates some of these things work in, as well as other people's research. And that is, have a good relationship with your, with your kids. Talk to them, spend quality time with them. Uh, get to know their friends. Help them engage in positive activities. There's an, there's an idea, there's a, a term used in uh, uh, criminological research called unstructured socializing. Basically, it's what my father-in-law used to call hanging on the street corner. Did your, did your dad ever say, don't hang on the street corner? That's sort of what this idea is. And what they found was that as little as three hours, this research showed that as little as three hours of unstructured socializing, in other words, being with your friends and having no adult supervision, raise the risk of, of alcohol and marijuana use about 60 or 70 percent. So know where your kids are, okay? Be a good example, okay? If you don't want your kids to drink alcohol or eat too much sugar, you shouldn't drink alcohol or eat too much sugar, all right? So it, it, it sounds really simple, but being a good example is, is, is really important for this. Okay, more good news. There are effective prevention programs. I sort of, uh, I sort of uh, stepped on the neck of prevention programs, but there are effective programs. A few years ago, um, we had the uh, Margie Pay Hinckley uh, lecturer, was it was lecturer, is that the title? And uh, um, we had um, Dr. Uh, David Hawkins from Washington, from University of Washington come and talk about this program that he started called Communities That Care. If you've heard of it, it's because it's in the two or three cities or, 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 or communities in Utah. And what they do is communities that care, they go, it's in, it's in dozens of program, uh, communities throughout the country now. What they do is they go in and they do, they sort of get to know the community. They get to know what are the problems in this community. Is it kids using drugs? Is it kids, you know, vandalizing things? Is it kids um, using alcohol? Is it, you know, what is the problem in the community? And then they tailor the program. But the program includes not just the schools, which is where a lot of drug prevention get, goes on is in the schools, but they include the families and they include the communities too. It's not easy to do, but it's, it's effective. The, re his, the research they've, they've done, they've done dozens of papers on this. And just to give you an example, by young adulthood, they've been following kids for, for about 10 or 15 years now in some of these communities. What they found was that they're 33% less likely to start smoking cigarettes, 37% less likely to engage in heavy alcohol use, and 24% less likely to use marijuana. So prevention success story right there for you. Now, it keeps getting better. This is probably the, this may be the greatest public health um, success story of the last 50 years, and that is the decrease in cigarette use. Here I've got information about youth as well as adults, and from in the 1950s, 60s, about 40% of adults smoked. You know, we have those commercials now, what were you thinking? But yeah, there were almost, you know, almost half of the adults were smoking at that time. It's gone down, it's gone way down now. It's less than 15% of, 15% uh, among adults and less than 10% among kids. In Utah, we are the first state, we can be proud of ourselves, pat ourselves on the back, we're the first state to go underneath 10%. Okay, we were the first state. I don't know if there are any others. Um, and there's some suggestion, their paper just came out in a tobacco journal, tobacco research journal, that suggests that this decrease in cigarette use has also had a, posi has also had a positive effect by, by also being associated with a decreased use of amphetamines, tranquilizers, opioids. I sort of made fun of the gateway theory earlier, but something's going on here. That, you know, there's some de-romanticization -romantis of cigarette use that may have spilled over into, maybe there's a little bit of that for other kinds of drugs too, because we've seen a, a precipitous drop in, in, in these other substances. Um, there are some good and, you know, not so good stories. One is marijuana use has, has kind of leveled off. It bumps up and down a little bit. Um, so that may be bad news to a certain extent. But substance use disorders among kids have gone down quite a bit, which is good news for us. Um, one of the problems we have is vaping. I mentioned vaping earlier. Vaping has more than doubled in the last four years or so. So a lot of kids are vaping these days, but it doesn't seem to have spilled over into uh, more cigarette use, although there's a lot of research going on about, about that right now. Now we do have problems, obviously. The opioid epidemic is causing serious problems. This is just for youth. We've seen um, deaths, they dropped a little bit, but then they went back up. Now they're flattening out. You know, the opioid, I obviously don't have time to talk about that, but that's a serious problem right now 
and um, something that we're going to have to continue to deal with. But there's, some, there's a little bit of good news out there. Okay, so let me finish off on a positive note. A um, number of years ago, a UCLA uh, psychopharmacologist by the name of Ron, Ronald Siegel uh, wrote, a book, wrote a really interesting book, published a really interesting book called Intoxication. His thesis in that book was that just like our drive to, to eat, to procreate, whatever it may be, just like these biological drives, he, posit, he, he, he thought that we had a sort of a natural tendency to seek altered states of consciousness, as he called them. Okay, and so, and he looked at various places in the animal kingdom and found lots of animals like to get high, just like humans like to get high, basically. So his point was that if this is a natural, if this is a natural thing, then what can we do about it? Well, I think we need to change the myth about, about you know, sort of the, the inherent evilness of drug use and how that spills over into the evilness of drug users. Change that myth to in, in some way so that we do a couple things. One is we, admit, we, we, we just have to admit that people are gonna get high. People are gonna find things that bend their minds. Um, Corey, who works in the, in the drug treatment field, can tell you about the kinds of things people will put up their nose or, you know, or, or, or inject in their veins or something like that to get high. It's going to happen, okay? Um, as, members, as a member of the church, I obviously don't think that's a good idea, but I'm realistic, and I think we all should be realistic that people are going to do it. So what can we do about it? Well, what we need to do is figure out a couple things. Figure out a lot more about setting. You know, what is the setting people are using? If they're using in a setting or they have other, or they have a personal issues that, le that are going to lead them to having problems with that use, we need to work with them, not against them. We need to not, to, to not demonize them. We need to think about, you know, think about them as, uh, as, as, as not the others. And we need to help them, the, those who are going to have problems, who we, think, who, we, who we suspect or through research we know are going to have problems, we need to help them because, as I mentioned earlier, they are us. Thank you very much. Let's give him uh, one more hand. We have a nice plaque oh. here to honor him as well. Thank you.